we can start our session. Thank you, our participants, for uh, joining our session. Uh, this session is uh, prepared by Yatena Wag and Ethiopian Medical Association. Um, uh, today, we're going to have a discussion on road traffic accident and polytrauma. Uh, joining us with uh, Dr. Beth. Uh, meanwhile, let me tell you about uh, Yatena Wag. Uh, Yet in our work, um, was founded uh, two, uh, two year, uh, three years back. Uh, uh, the first, uh, the initial plan was to uh, make podcasts, and we made a website where we could where we could find uh, health informations made in our local country uh, language in Amharic, and uh, uh, and after that we had this continuous medical education as well as mentorship programs where we mentor medical students as well as uh, any person who can mentor can mentor this uh, mentees from medical uh, schools and we work with young medical students who are eager to uh, be part in this uh, platform and uh, our opening uh, we're working in this uh, a research and QI project where we plan to uh, open this session to uh, any person who is interested in research. We'll be making it, we'll be talking about it in the future. So it in our has a lot of platforms. You can check our website. We'll be check, we'll be sending you our links to join our social media platforms. Uh, today uh, we're joined by Dr. Beth. Let me tell you uh, about her. Dr. Beth Hodgman is an acute care surgeon and intensivist in Columbia University Medical Center in New York. Uh, she completed her medical school and general surgery residency training at Columbia University, and then completed fellowship training in trauma emergency surgery in critical care at the University of Pennsylvania before returning to uh, Columbia. She's currently working as co-director of surgical intensive care unit in. CUIMC Division of Critical Care Medicine, New York, and also Associate Professor of Surgery and Director of Global Surgery in CUIMC Department of Surgery. She's got multiple licensure and board certification and honors and awards. Uh, one of the uh, one of which was in 2000, uh, 2022 Super Doctor New York Rising Star, given this year 2023. She's part of different professional organizations and societies like American College of Surgeons, International Society of Surgery, and WHO's Global Initiative for Emergency and Essential Surgical Care. She's got multiple publications and educational contributions and clinical. Uh, and public health innovations and activities in our own country, Ethiopia, with uh, American College of Six, uh, American College of Surgeons and COSEXA, Hawasa Hub, as part of longitudinal bi bi bidirectional partnership with Ethiopian College of uh, with Ethiopian colleagues in Hawasa, as well as representatives from twelve other North American institutions. She's also a member of education, uh, quality and trauma systems subcommittees, all developing long-term projects. She has collaborated on research projects, participated in ICU, uh, telemedicine activities, and have delivered on-site multiple lectures and skill sessions like laparoscopy, ultrasound, mechanical ventilation, residents as teachers and suturing skills and team course, moderated international uh, intersecting case dis uh, discussions and operated alongside Ethiopian colleagues. I am very much honored to welcome our guest, Dr. Beth. You can continue. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. And I, I don't think I've ever seen these little floating clapping hands before. That's <laughs> that's pretty cool. It's a new feature of Zoom that I hadn't, hadn't seen before. Um, all right, let me um, go ahead and share my slides. Here we go. Okay, so um, so as was mentioned, I'm my uh, goal today is to review a very broad level how um, uh, we would approach uh, road traffic accidents and polytrauma from an initial evaluation and management point. Um, of course, I could spend hours and hours and days and days and in fact years um, discussing all of the different nuances of how to manage patients with with different types of um, injuries. But um, for the purposes of today, I'm focusing specifically on that initial moment, that initial evaluation um, that uh, when, when a patient is coming to you. And doing so, um, I, I'm going to focus on the perspective of um, clinicians who are in a um, 
a hospital facility of some kind, uh, not roadside. But a lot of the stuff that I'm going to talk about is applicable in any environment. Um, and I think that's an important concept to remember. So uh, again, I'm going to first describe uh, just the ideal approach that, that we use at my institution and, um, and across the United States as well as internationally, which is um, the ATLS paradigm, um, it's advanced trauma life support. Uh, then we're going to talk a little bit also about how one can adjust or how a group can, can adjust when the, uh, depending on the system and the resources that you have. Um, and then within that, I'll also, we'll go into some details in a case-based fashion about um, when to image somebody and how, when to intervene um, in a, uh, and in which ways and when to transfer. So just to start with, I think it's really important um, always to understand your resources um, in, in whatever environment you're in when you're dealing with a trauma patient. And so resources include, um, most importantly, the people that you have on your team. Uh, and, and who's on your team is, it's really, if you can understand who you're working with, what their skill sets are, um, and what they're comfortable doing, that's a really, really incredibly helpful starting point. In general, in a trauma environment, um, and perhaps those who work um, specifically at Alert, the the trauma hospital um, may um, may already be very familiar with this. But uh, typically, in in our system, um, in a main in a major trauma center, um, the team is pretty sizable. There's a number of people involved. Um, first and foremost, there's uh, somebody who's self described as the team leader. Um, and usually that person um, is helping organize all the activities that are happening around a given trauma patient. Um, and so it's important as a consequence of their need to be able to organize what's happening is if there are enough people around, that team leader is standing um, at the foot of the bed of the patient. This is our trauma patient here. Um, and helping um, direct those that are that are around um, in an orderly fashion what needs to happen. And so the next person that's around, um, typically uh, we have a, a nurse or some or a technician, someone who can help with placing lines, um, specifically IV, getting IV access um, and putting um, monitors on the patient. Um, and they typically in, in our system are standing on the patient's right side um, for a very particular reason, which I'll explain um, a little bit later. Uh, but we try to have a, a pretty consistent system of where people are standing around a given trauma patient, just because there's tip, there's often so much chaos that um, knowing where where to be is is a very helpful way of limiting chaos where one can. The next person that um, is typically on our trauma team is an airway specialist um, that you know, can, can be any type of um, trained airway individual. So in our system, that can be somebody from the ER, that might be an anesthesiologist. Um, there, there are multiple different um, types of um, folks in, in both of those realms that can serve as the airway person. Surgery um, team members also can be airway folks, depending on the situation. And then we have a primary surveyor. That primary surveyor is typically um, standing on the patient's left and they're, they are responsible for um, doing uh, the, the full assessment um, of, the, of the patient. And we'll, we'll talk through that, what that entails. And then if there's more people around, we typically have somebody who is assisting the airway person. And we typically have somebody who is assisting the, the survey, the primary survey person. The, the, that person, um, this last blue dot that I just put up, um, can help with procedures that need to occur. Um, and the, the primary surveyor also is somebody that um, is generally going to be doing any kind of surgical procedures on the, on the patient. While the team leader, I want to highlight again, um, at the foot of the bed is is choreographing this whole move. And then um, not, uh, not to underestimate, the this last blue dot that I have here represents the scribe. So typically um, in our system, it is really important to document everything that we're, we're seeing and doing. Um, and when you're in the um, action, either you know establishing an airway or um, surveying, doing your primary survey of the patient um, or placing um, 
IV access, et cetera, um, it's challenging for those people to be scribing, to be documenting, you know, what's happening. So if there are people, you know, typically our full team includes also a, a separate individual who is scribing um, for the, the team exactly what's happening. Um, so that constitutes what we would say in our system is the ideal um, number of people on a team. That's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven people total. Um, more than that actually is too much because then um, the people in the room start to get confused about what they're supposed to do and how they help. And then the noise level in the room gets so high um, that you can't actually hear what needs to be said and done. Um, too few um, or fewer than seven is something that one that we can manage and is often um, often what happens um, depending on the, uh, the scenario where you are, how many patients are coming in at the same time. Um, sometimes seven, seven people on a team is simply infeasible um, and that's okay. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that and how to, how to arrange um, when that happens. Um, in our system, we tend to in major trauma centers have what's called pre-notification. So we know beforehand we get alerts from our um, from our ambulance system uh, when patients are coming in and a, just a very brief alert saying what the what the problem is, you know, whether this is a motor vehicle accident or a gunshot wound, for example, um, that gives us a couple minutes to, to prepare ourselves. And so when we have that opportunity, which is not always the case, sometimes um, patients um, simply arrive unexpected and you don't have time to prepare. But when you do have time to prepare, um, it's very helpful keeping in mind um, the, the, um, the different things that are going to need to happen to evaluate your patient um, and the different team members that are going to be involved. It's very helpful to plan in advance as the patient's arriving, um, who's going to fill what role. So gathering your team members, identifying and assigning the roles for those team members super, super helpful to do that in advance. Um, it really minimizes the, the chaos that can occur as the patient's arriving. And then always super important um, to don your PPE. Um, that, um, of course, is, is critically important to protect yourself um, as well as the patient um, to make sure that you're um, any you know, you, you don't know what, what bugs that, that patient might be carrying on them, or um, certainly in a trauma environment, the most common thing is that there is um, blood and other uh, liquids that may be um, splashing around and you don't want to get that on you. Um, so donning PPE is really important to, to protect yourself and you can't take care of patients unless you're, um, unless you're well yourself. And then the other thing that's very helpful, um, if you can, is to prep for possible procedures. So you anticipate based on what the injury is, what interventions that patient might need, um, and then and try to get the equipment ready for those those particular procedures. So we'll talk about um, what all of these things in a bit more detail shortly, but I wanted to give you that that broad overview. And I also wanted to highlight, I, you know, I wrote um, on here um, that the team includes trauma ACS. It's, this is, again, goes back to knowing your system and knowing who's in your hospital or who's in your facility that you're working in. Um, in, in my hospital, the, the trauma team or the ACS, the acute care surgery team, um, is a, a, a discrete team um, separate from the ER. And so the trauma patients that come in are first evaluated by the ER team and the ER team needs to let us know when they need us to come. So it's I, it really helpful for them to remember. Um, and I encourage everybody else to remember, you know, Call call your your resources early. Um, know who's around before stuff comes in, before um, before patients come in, um, and that that will facilitate your ability to reach out to 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 people um, to help you as as um, emergencies are arriving. So how do we um, how do we approach a trauma in any any kind of trauma resuscitation, no matter what the injury is? The first thing we do um, is a primary survey. Um, when I say primary survey, uh, we're gonna go through all the elements of that, but it's a very um, orderly and regimented approach that we use that follows the, the ATLS paradigm, that, um, which is a, a paradigm that is, um, was developed by the American College of Surgeons uh, in the 1970s or 80s, um, so several decades ago now. Um, but uh, the, the idea behind the, the order or the elements of uh, the primary survey is that 
um, we are aiming to identify as quickly as possible the most life-threatening problems for any given trauma patient and then address them in, in an orderly fashion that will um, address those, those life-threatening um, injuries or problems um, in, a, in a way that can hopefully um, help the patient um, most effectively. So in the primary survey, the first thing that we assess is airway. Uh, and, and when I say airway, I mean literally the, the passage, the, 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 the tube that allows air to go from outside into the lungs. Um, and I say it that way because sometimes it can be confusing um, to think about the, the airway itself and the, the lungs as a, the, the same problem. But really um, in, in the context of, of ATLS and the, the way we think about trauma patients, we're talking simply about that, that tube and making sure that the airway is patent and able to um, allow transit of air in both directions. And so the terminology that we tend to use is, is, is the airway patent? Is it open? Um, and is the trachea midline? If the trachea is off to the side, that suggests that it's, it's, it's going to be um, obstructed uh, if, it, if it isn't already. And that's something that, you're, that will need to be addressed. One other thing I want to highlight um, before we even go further into the elements of the primary survey is that the idea behind um, this approach uh, is to Again, these are these are the things that are going to be most life threatening to um, uh, any given individual, and the order in which they are most life threatening. So, um, especially when you have a very small team, uh, we the approach um, of ATLS is to stop at each step if if it is inadequate. So if the airway is not patent, you stop at that moment and address the airway and make sure it's patent before you move on to the next step. Um, when you have a large team, when you have that full seven person team, you can actually address all the steps of the primary survey in somewhat a simultaneous fashion with the team leader um, identifying um, and organizing those motions. Um, but the, the concept remains that we still do, do this evaluation in an orderly fashion and pause to address anything that's identified as inadequate. Similarly, anytime anything um, changes, we, we go back to the beginning of our assessment and make sure we haven't missed something. So airway, as I said, is the first step of the primary survey. And um, when we're trying to establish a patent airway, um, we're trying to um, it, it, uh, confirm that air is able to pass through um, through the vocal cords into um, and out of the lungs. And so when somebody is talking to you as I am now, you can automatically know that my airway is patent. You automatically know your patient's airway is patent if they are able to speak to you. Um, so uh, one really um, simple gesture that I usually do whenever I'm seeing a trauma patient for, uh, in the first moment is I just ask them what happened. And if they can start to tell me what happened, I already know that their airway is patent and I can move on to the next thing, which is breathing. So breathing refers to the, the lung in the ability to actually um, oxygenate and, and, um, and ventilate at the, the lung level. So your airway, if the airway is patent, that's all well and good. But if your lungs completely collapsed, then your ability to breathe is still significantly impaired. And so what we're looking for in when evaluating breathing is the presence of breath sounds on both sides. Um, and, and if you have the, um, the patient connected to a monitor, we're looking also at their sa oxygen saturation and their respiratory rate. Of course, you don't need a monitor to measure somebody's respiratory rate, um, but you can uh, also look at the, how labored their breathing is or how comfortable their breathing is. Those are things that tell you whether their breathing is compromised. Um, overall, if, if somebody has no breath sounds on one side, for example, um, and their oxygen saturation is poor or they're clearly breathing in a labored fashion, that's a moment where we're going to um, want to intervene. And in a trauma environment, we presume when there's no lung sounds um, on one side that that is um, usually the consequence of a pneumothorax or a hemothorax or a combined hemopneumothorax. So that's somebody who would need a chest tube. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. Um, the next element of the primary survey is circulation. And so this refers to, as it sounds, the how, how well the person's circulation um, is functioning and specifically their, their 
blood supply, their internal blood supply. So we're talking about, um, do they have um, uh, adequate uh, blood flow to perfuse their organs? Do they have palpable pulses? Um, is their heart rate within a normal range? Is their blood pressure within an appropriate range? Do they have IV access so that we can give them fluids and if, if the, the need arises blood um, in order to restore those things to normal? So if somebody um, is has thready pulses or has a very fat, high heart rate or low blood pressure, that's somebody that you're going to automatically, um, you know, as you're evaluating them, you're going to want to give them fluid. Um, and what kind of fluid, we'll talk about it a little bit later, but um, of course, depends on what you have available and what you think the person needs. If they're just, um, if they just need a little bit of fluid back, then crystalloid is, um, is the way to go and usually is adequate. Um, but if somebody is significantly compromised, then they are likely going to require blood products. Um, and, uh, and, uh, um, depending on what blood products you have available, um, that may impact, um, what you can give. The next element of the primary survey is disability. So this refers to specifically whether somebody has traumatic brain injury or spinal cord injury. Um, and the way that we assess that um, is uh, by using something called the Glasgow Coma Score, GCS. Um, and the GCS really is, is a scoring system that helps us understand or evaluate whether somebody might have intracranial injury. Um, the other um, uh, elements that I have listed here or the, the acronyms that I have listed here are, I find an, um, a very important component of disability because not only are we on trying to understand if there's intracranial um, uh, uh, disease, um, which is manifested by an abnormal Glasgow coma, scare, coma score, um, but um, their ability to move all extremities, MAE, moving all extremities, um, is a uh, also helps you understand whether they may have spinal cord injury. Of course, moving extremities is potentially impacted by intracranial injury as well, but um, that you could have a normal um, uh, GCS. You could have no intracranial injury and yet have um, spinal cord injury and, and have um, impaired ability to move the extremities. So it's important to, in, um, in my opinion, include both of those details. And then looking at one's pupils, the patient's pupils is a helpful way of assessing, um, again, for any inter intracranial injury that you need to be aware of. So that's disability. Um, and then, oops, uh, oh yeah. So just to pause for a moment and review the Glasgow Coma Scale, um, the the GCS is um, comprised of three different components: eyes, verbal, and motor. And the way we assess it um, is we uh, assign points to whatever the the patient is the the best the patient is able to do in each of these categories. So if someone's eyes are open spontaneously they're speaking in a normal, um, uh, understandable way, um, and they're moving everything and following commands, that is, they have a normal um, score. So they have um, four, they get four points for eyes, five points for verbal, and six points for motor That for a total of 15. Um, I think it's really important to, to keep in mind or, or recognize that the lowest score one can get is a three. Um, so a, a dead person has a GCS of three. Um, and a uh, the opposite end of the scale, the highest score one can get is 15. Um, this is helpful to remember because um, if somebody has a very high Glasgow Coma Scale score, um, your, your level of concern for intracranial injury is relatively low. Um, but as that number goes down, um, you your level of concern should be heightened for intracranial injury. And then along with that, your level of concern should also be heightened for their ability to actually protect their airway, which brings us right back to A in the primary survey. And so when somebody's GCS score is less than eight, um, that is a cutoff number that we use as a guide to say, this person is not going to be able to protect their airway and we need to establish one. And so we generally say, if the GCS is less than eight, then one should intubate. Um, the, the next component of primary survey, E for exposure. Um, so exposure means actually, as it sounds, uh, fully exposing the, the patient's body. So you can I, ideally assess 
any injuries or uh, broadly assess whether there are injuries um, anywhere else that you haven't already um, uh, ascertained by going through the, the other elements of the primary survey. So this means taking all of their clothes off and also rolling them. Um, a log roll is an approach that we, we use um, to, to roll patients in a fashion that protects their um, their C-spine, uh, their cervical spine. We always make an assumption in a trauma environment that um, until proven otherwise, you, you, we assume that somebody has an unstable spine until we have um, had an opportunity to fully assess them. Um, so we log roll patients in a coordinated way. And I can, we'll describe that a little bit more later. Um, and uh, in doing so, you look at their back and you evaluate um, the entire the entire posterior aspect of the patient and also their axilla and their groin um, to ensure again that you've you've identified any um, any injuries that that might not have been um, apparent already and then cover the patient back up and, and warm them one thing that is um, easy to forget um, in the trauma environment um, and not in the trauma environment for that matter is that um, hypothermia um, being cold um, can contribute to coagulopathy, which worsens bleeding, which worsens, of course, the, the patient's outcomes. So we, as soon as we're done exposing and, and evaluating everything, we cover the patient up and try to keep them warm so that we can um, optimize their, their outcomes. So that's all of the primary survey. And then there's um, what I have listed here, FAST and chest x-ray are what we, what I would call the adjuncts to the primary survey. So a FAST exam um, is uh, an ultrasound exam um, that uh, allows you to evaluate very quickly um, the for the possibility of uh, intrathoracic blood or intra-abdominal blood. Um, and that can, of course, if you identify um, blood in those spaces, that can that can help guide treatment um, thereafter. In our um, in our system, we we basically fast and get a chest x-ray for every trauma patient. Um, the reason we do that is because these adjuncts allow us to do what's called cavitary triage. So the FAST exam, as I mentioned, allows us to look at um, the pericardial space and make sure there's no tamponade um, or, or blood in the pericardial space. And then also um, in the abdomen, um, we look for, for the presence of blood. So that's the, the cavities, um, uh, when I say cavitary triage, are head, chest, abdomen, retroperitoneum, pelvis, and extremities. So, cav so the FAST exam helps us at, um, evaluate the abdominal cavity and the thoracic cavity. Um, because in addition to looking at the pericardium, an, an extended FAST, um, can, you can look at the, um, the pleural cavities. For those who are not familiar with or comfortable doing uh, Fast, a chest x-ray is what's very helpful to, to look at the, the pleural cavities and evaluate whether there's something urgent that needs to be addressed that you haven't, again, already identified earlier in your primary survey. Um, so uh, the findings of the FAST and the chest x-ray can um, are considered adjuncts to the primary survey because they allow you to um, uh, complete your initial so-called cavitary triage. Um, and again, to, to to go through the different cavities, the head, um, you're evaluating, you're, you're triaging that um, cavity based on your disability assessment. Um, chest, you're uh, triaging that cavity based on um, airway and breathing assessments, as well as your fast and chest x-ray findings. The abdomen, you are um, evaluating or, or uh, triaging based on your um, exposure as well as your fast exam um, and then also your circulation that's that's giving you a sense of um, of what's going on um, uh, in terms of perfusion um, and retroperitoneal cavity is also something or pelvis um, that's also something that you're evaluating both on your exposure as well as um, within circulation um, and then extremities you're also your that cavity you're going to evaluate during exposure so we um, by by doing the primary survey in this way um, or evaluating the patient using this this systematic approach with um, the airway breathing circulation disability exposure, you're systematically um, addressing all of the major ways that somebody could be injured, um, uh, hopefully addressing them in a um, timely fashion and in a in an order that that allows you to rescue them to the best of your ability and doing cavitary triage all simultaneously. 
Um, the secondary survey is uh, basically a full head to toe exam again, um, again to more thoroughly evaluate for um, any injuries that you may have missed um, in the in the more um, broad primary survey. So this involves really thoroughly evaluating um, the uh, all the aspects of the the face, the the head, neck, etc. Um, moving all the way down the body, doing a full neuro exam, um, and also getting a full story from the patient if they're able to provide it of their past medical history, um, their um, past surgical history, their allergies, the medications they take, etc. Um, getting a full history and physical um, in order to um, uh, augment the information that you've you've gleaned from your primary survey. Something that many people um, don't realize is that depending on the severity of the patient, the severity of the injuries, you may not get to your secondary survey, and that's okay. Um, the the important thing is completing your primary survey so that you can make sure that you've gotten all of the, the most critical information. Um, and then with that, um, establishing your treatment strategy. But the secondary survey is um, uh, extremely helpful for identifying additional information um, that can um, that can help um, help you implement your treatment strategy. Um, the things that I've mentioned here, AMPLE is a, another fun acronym to help remember um, what uh, the, the most um, most important details of a secondary survey um, in terms of the, the history aspect of things. Um, that includes allergies, meds, past medical and surgical history, last meal. Um, the reason we ask that is because on the assumption that they might need an intervention with general anesthesia, we wanna know, we wanna be able to um, be aware of what's in their stomach and what might be coming up at us. And then E is for environment. Um, that helps, um, it's helpful if you can um, to get information about what happened at the scene. Um, you know, how did this trauma occur? Um, who else was there? Were there significant injuries um, for other people around? That can also help you understand or heighten your level of suspicion for the, the severity of injuries that your patient might have. And then. Um, Anytime something is changing, if the patient's clinical picture suddenly um, changes, then going right back to the beginning of your, your primary survey, the ABCs, as we call it, um, is a, a very helpful way of just organizing your thoughts and, and making sure that you're, um, you're addressing the, the, the problems that the patients are encountering. Why do we do it like this? This sounded like a lot of information that I just threw at you. Um, it's because trauma is a completely chaotic environment. Um, whether you have one trauma patient or several trauma patients, it's always complete mayhem. Um, and it's like this big ball of knotted up um, wires. And when we have in mind a shared systematic approach to um, how to evaluate a trauma patient, then this ball of wires can become much more easily manageable um, because you, you suddenly remove a lot of the, the uncertainty um, around how to approach the patient and are able to really just focus on what's in front of you. And so, you know, while I'm describing what um, uh, the American College of Surgeons promotes as the, the, um, the ideal strategy, ATLS, um, there are other systematic approaches that, that um, people use in other, um, in other places. Um, but we have found um, that when, when um, whatever system you're using is a shared system that the, the whole team is aware of. This is how we're evaluating the patient. Um, it, it really helps streamline the approach and, and limit some of the chaos so that you can really focus your energy on um, managing the problem in front of you. So um, the you know, I, I talked earlier about who does what exactly. Um, and so I just have it written out for you here. The reason I'm writing it out or I'm, I'm explicitly saying, showing this um, in this way again is because I wanna highlight um, that there's there's a lot happening um, and a lot of things to be done um, when you're evaluating a trauma patient. And that's um, and for that reason, it's very helpful um, again to have a systematic approach and have um, make sure that um, to the best of your ability, people understand what their roles and responsibilities are, um, so that you can accomplish what you need to accomplish quickly and effectively. Um, the team leader is the the one that um, really. Um, organizes all of this activity. Um, and in many circumstances, you do not have this many people around. Um, that should come as no great surprise. And so what happens when you don't have this many people around? The, the roles start to get 
and responsibilities get merged. So if you don't have somebody to be ascribed, the team leader will ultimately be ascribed after everything's said and done. They'll document what happened. If you don't have an extra person to assist with the FAST exam or procedures, um, then the person who's doing the primary survey is going to do the FAST exam. If you don't have somebody to assist with the airway, um, then the um, clinician who is um, helping with placing IVs and putting the patient on monitors will also be able to assist with the airway. If you don't have somebody specifically available to do the primary survey and the procedures um, and the FAST exam, um, then the team leader ends up being that person. Um, and then if you don't have that many people, um, then the team leader ends up also becoming the airway person. Um, you get my drift. And so this is why um, it's important to, again, have in mind a systematic approach, like how, how are we going to go through things in an orderly fashion? Because um, if you're down to only two people, or if you're down to only one person, um, then um, you really have to go through um, those those elements of the primary survey in you know one thing at a time. You can't be doing it simultaneously. Whereas when you have many people around, the team leader can coordinate having those things be done simultaneously. And then it becomes like a, chore a beautiful choreographed dance um, where people are moving around and they um, understand what needs to happen um, and the team leader is helping guide them. So let's talk through some cases. Um, and we don't have a, a tremendous this amount of time. So I'm going to breeze through these just to, um, just to give you a sense of how, um, how one might approach um, these problems. So here's a patient who arrives to you after a motor, motor, motor vehicle accident, excuse me, um, without seatbelts. And so therefore he flew through the windshield and busted his face. Um, and this is, this is what's coming to you. Um, so this is somebody who I would describe as has a threatened airway. Um, obviously, you know, we can't, we can't um, hear him um, breathing through this picture, but you can imagine looking at this picture um, that this person is not breathing very, very uh, comfortably or easily, um, or not passing air through their mouth um, very comfortably or easily. Um, and so um, this is somebody who you're, you're going to want to establish an airway um, uh, quickly in order to, to maintain um, their ability to um, pass air uh, in, into their lungs and out of their lungs. So um, also what's notable here, of course, this, this uh, injury is pretty significant um, to their face. This might be a very difficult intubation. Um, and so when, um, when intubations are difficult or simply impossible, um, the next thing that the emergency strategy that that is at our disposal is to do a, a crike, a cricothyroidotomy. Um, this is something that you know everybody um, hopes they never have to do, but um, is um, important to know the basics of how to do it. And so the landmarks um, that you're looking for are um, the thyroid cartilage, the cricoid cartilage. In between those is the cricothyroid membrane, and that's where you go. Um, that's where you center your incision um, for an emergency cricothyroidotomy. Um, really important detail that I always remind people is when you're doing an emergent airway, the skin incision that you make must be vertical. The reason why we um, we say that um, that it's a vertical skin incision is because. Um, a couple reasons. First of all, the anterior jugulars run just lateral to midline. And so if you make a transverse incision, um, you are very likely to cut through the anterior jugulars and cause a significant amount of bleeding, which will obstruct your view and then obstruct your ability to, to do what you're attempting to do. The other reason to make a vertical incision is that in the heat of the moment, sometimes it can be quite challenging to identify your landmarks and you might um, be not quite um, in the area where you intended to be. So a vertical incision allows you to adjust where you're, um, if you have a transverse incision, it's very hard um, in, a, in a, an emergent moment to, to, um, to dissect down or up and access the, the cricothyroid membrane. The vertical incision allows you to really have access up and down um, in a way that you can access it. And the reason we say go through the cricothyroid membrane rather than down in the trachea, which is what we would do in an elective environment, 
is because the cricothyroid membrane is the most superficial. Um, the trachea can be quite um, deep. And also there's nothing sitting on top of the cricothyroid membrane, whereas the trachea has a thyroid isthmus sitting on top of it. And so it can, can actually be quite challenging sometimes to, um, to get down to the trachea um, readily. So the, the cricothyroid membrane is the space where we, um, where we go when you are unable to intubate um, this gentleman, for example, um, and, uh, and, and need to establish an airway. Um, so vertical incision in the skin and then transverse incision in the cricothyroid membrane. Um, then you dissect open and, and get your, your hollow tube in, whatever, whatever hollow tube that you have that can then be connected to um, a bag mask um, or a ventilator if you have one. Okay, so moving along. You have um, a patient come to you who has a stab wound above their right nipple. Um, they're talking to you comfortably. Um, they're, so their airway is patent. You listen to their breath sounds and there's diminished breath sounds on one side. Um, at this point, you now have a, um, uh, the, the opportunity to, to continue getting more information because they're breathing comfortably, as I said. And when you connect them to the monitor, you see they're saturating um, quite well, 96%. So this is a patient who you have an opportunity to proceed um, systematically through the remainder of your primary survey because they are not compromised right now. Um, you know that they have diminished breath sounds, but they're, as I said, breathing comfortably and oxygen saturation is appropriate. So you can continue on um, and, and um, establish what their circulation is, that their vital signs, their blood pressure, their heart rate are normal, that their pulses are palpable. You can evaluate their disability and identify that their GCS is 15, that they're moving everything. Um, exposure, reveal that one wound um, that you um, have been told exists over their right nipple. And, and then you might get down so far as to then obtain your x-ray. When you see an x-ray like this, um, I, I don't know how well this is appearing on your screens. I hope that you can see that on the right side, this person has a pretty sizable pneumothorax. So this is somebody who you would need to put in um, a chest tube. But um, I wanna highlight again, that this is somebody because they, are, they were stable, you were able to get through your primary survey to this point and then um, identify this pneumothorax and then proceed um, in an in a, um, orderly fashion. Let's change the scenario a little bit. Let's say that this person is not stable, that they have diminished breath sounds on the right and they have labored breathing and their oxygen saturation is dropping. That's somebody who at that moment at, at B in your primary survey, you're gonna pause and you're going to address um, that, that problem um, right away and put the chest tube in right away, as opposed to continuing on through your primary survey. Um, and I'll, uh, talk about the process of putting in a chest tube in just a moment. Um, I'll just give you another example. Um, this patient, a gunshot wound, uh, arrives with a gunshot wound to the left back and he's in respiratory distress. Again, this is somebody who um, uh, the airway we've assessed as patent, um, but he's in um, respiratory distress. If you happened to have an x-ray, this is what it would look like, but this is a patient who I would argue um, you would not have made your way all the way down through the primary survey to your adjuncts to get this x-ray um, before addressing um, the, the fluid in their chest first. Um, so much like this gentleman, um, this gentleman also is going to need a chest tube. So how do we put in a chest tube? Um, the, there are a couple different um, approaches to putting in a chest tube in terms of um, uh, the, the size of the tube that you use and whether you use a um, percutaneous tube versus a, a regular chest tube, um, regular meaning a, a, a more sizable tube. Um, in the trauma environment, we tend to use a, um, a bigger chest tube, however, um, um, what's most important is that you use the kind of tube that you are most comfortable with using because this is these are things that have to happen quickly. The landmarks for putting in a chest tube, um, generally speaking, are the fourth or fifth intercostal space in the anterior axillary line, and you're aiming to go right above the rib. And as you can see in this schematic view or this schematic image, the reason you aim to put your chest tube in immediately above a rib is because the neurovascular bundle, generally speaking, runs immediately below all ribs. And so if you were to try to put a tube immediately below a rib, you're very liable to hit a vessel and cause bleeding or cause more trauma to the person. So um, when you identify your landmarks, the fourth or fifth intercostal space, which in a male is at the nipple line, in a female is at the inframammary fold, 
you identify your, your um, fourth or fifth intercostal space, you go into the anterior axillary line, you make an incision right over the rib, um, and then you dissect down over that rib and pop into the space immediately over the rib and slide the, the tube in. All you need is a knife, a Kelly and a, and a big chest tube. Um, and again, I put this little asterisk here because, um, you know, I, I say thir at least 32 French. However, um, it, whatever tube you have <laughs> is, is, um, is going to be the, the appropriate thing to use in an, in an emergency environment. Um, and what we're learning in our trauma literature is that um, we have already gone, um, we've progressively used smaller and smaller tubes. We used to say 40 French chest tube, then 36 French, then 32, now, and, and now we're, we're going less and less invasive. Um, so whichever size tube you have, um, if you, even if it's smaller than a 32, if it's a 28, et cetera, um, or if you have a percutaneous chest tube kit, those um, that that can can be used. But what um, is most important is that you can do it quickly. Um, all right. So moving along, now we get to circulation. So this patient um, is someone who punched through a plate glass window, um, and then and apparently there was a lot of blood at the scene. You can imagine why, based on this injury. As you're doing your primary survey, you would notice uh, or you take note, the airway is patent, the person's breathing comfortably, they have um, clear breath sounds bilaterally, their oxygen saturation is normal, um, but um, their circulation is compromised, their heart rate is, is elevated, um, their blood pressure is low, um, and this is somebody who clearly has um, an obvious source of, of bleeding. So this is somebody who um, you're, you want to so-called stop the bleed. Um, this is a, a, a course, Stop the Bleed, that the American College of Surgeons um, uh, puts on um, that is um, a, a very helpful uh, course to uh, review the most effective ways to stop, to quote, stop the bleed. Um, and so uh, what I think really important for, for people to remember is that when you have um, a wound, depending on the dimensions of the wound, um, no matter what, putting direct pressure is the, is the ideal strategy for controlling bleeding. Um, but if it's a deep wound, then you want to actually pack that wound rather than just touch on the top. Um, that's a common mistake that people make that you can see here um, in the, um, the second row of images. When you just sort of gently um, put pressure on top of a deep wound that has welling from below, you're not actually putting direct pressure on the source of bleeding. So when you you have a deep wound, you do want to try to pack it if you can and hold pressure on top of that. Um, and then in circumstances where if that's not adequate, if that's not controlling the bleeding and you're finding that there's bleeding pooling around your hand or your dressing, that's, that's the kind of um, scenario that would call for a tourniquet. Um, and the ideal environment or the ideal um, injury for which a tourniquet is most useful is an, is an injury in the extremity. Um, we can't, um, as you can imagine, you cannot put a tourniquet around somebody's neck or around their, their trunk or their belly. It doesn't, it's not effective for the vessels that are injured there, but tourniquets are very effective for um, vascular injury in the extremities. So um, the, the rules of thumb around placing a tourniquet um, are you want to put the tourniquet on um, proximal to the injury, meaning closer to the heart than the injury. Um, and that's in order to make sure that you're controlling, you're limiting the inflow um, of blood to the area uh, from, from the heart. Um, so a tour any tourniquet that needs to be placed needs to go two or three inches above or proximal to the wound, closer to the heart. Um, you, if you try to put a tourniquet directly over a joint, you're not going to be able to achieve um, completely uh, compressing the area. And so that's why it's um, preferable to put a tourniquet um, not over a joint. And similarly, um, you can put a tourniquet over clothes in an emergency if you can't get their clothes off, um, um, but make sure that the clothes are not bunched up under your tourniquet. You want to make sure they're as smooth as possible. This is what allows the pressure of the tourniquet to really be um, evenly distributed and successfully cut off the blood flow to the area. And then you want to tighten the tourniquet until bleeding stops completely. Um, something that is um, often difficult for, for um, clinicians um, when they're using tourniquets is to understand that having a tourniquet on um, and on correctly is a painful experience, unfortunately, for the patient. Um, and that that is um, something that you need to know in order to remember um, that you are helping, if, if you are putting on the tourniquet because they had uncontrolled 
uncontrolled bleeding, um, then putting on the tourniquet and and um, accepting the pain that is involved with the, the tourniquet, in fact, being on um, is is nevertheless um, an important uh, uh, form of, of, of pain that you need to, to acknowledge or accept as you're, as you're helping limit their life-threatening bleeding. Um, if the, and, and you don't want to loosen it just because you're worried about it being painful. If it's on correctly, it should hurt, unfortunately, um, and you can provide pain medication for them, um, but don't loosen it just to alleviate the pain of the tourniquet. Um, the, the purpose of it is to stop bleeding that is life-threatening. Um, I think I'm going to skip through these bits um, because we're basically out of time. Um, and I'm going to go back actually, yes, to this patient. So here's um, another one final scenario. Um, actually, no, you know what? Let me skip to another. I think, I think this, this scenario might be a little bit more helpful. So there's a 24 year old who comes in with a gunshot wound to the chest and arrives anxious and yelling, sitting up in the stretcher. Um, you're told by the, the EMS, the um, emergency medical uh, system, that the patient has um, has those two wounds and the patient has been combative the entire way to the hospital. Combative meaning, um, you know, fighting against um, the, the clinicians that are trying to help. So you can clearly see this person's airway is patent. They're yelling. Um, their breathing is adequate. Um, they do have decreased breath sounds on the left, but they are satting a, an acceptable um, uh, oxygen saturation level. Um, but their circulation is compromised. They have a thready pulse. Um, their heart rate is elevated. Their blood pressure is low. Um, this is somebody who um, you should be very worried is in hemorrhagic shock. Um, and I, I want to highlight that when people are in hemorrhagic shock, the first thing that they experience, um, the first sign is anxiety. Um, the heart rate doesn't go up until they've lost quite a bit of blood. Um, so the, you know, one can lose up to 750 milliliters of blood just in an extremity. Um, and that can lead them to be anxious, um, but not necessarily have obvious, um, changes in their, in their vital signs. Um, when, uh, one loses significantly more than that, that's when their heart rate starts to go up and their pulse pressure um, narrows um, and their respiratory rate starts to go up. Um, and that's kind of representative of the amount of, of blood one can lose um, into a thigh. Um, and then as, as more bleeding occurs, um, then blood pressure starts to go down. That's the kind of patient who you are going to anticipate needing blood. Um, and that's the kind of patient who probably has a, a significant truncal injury in their chest or their abdomen. And that's um, uh, helpful to keep in mind when, when there's that much blood loss um, or that much hemodynamic derangement, um, you want to have a heightened level of suspicion for a, a significant injury um, in the in the, um, from the major blood vessels of the, of the body. And so, you know, it's helpful to, to be aware of these changes because it, um, when you see that somebody is hemodynamically deranged, even if you don't see, you know, immediately what their injuries are, um, you can get a sense of how bad their injuries are. Um, you can predict how much blood they might need, um, in order to help, um, address their problems. Um, and it can help you um, keep in mind um, what kinds of injuries to, to look for as you're progressing through your primary survey. Other things always to keep in mind is um, those who are extremes of age, um, children, elderly, and um, pregnant patients can have um, differences in their um, physiology that, uh, that that make hemodynamic changes a little bit less predictable, meaning children and pregnant women in particular um, are able to tolerate pretty significant um, blood loss before they manifest um, uh, hemodynamic derangements. And so if they are already um, developing hemodynamic derangements, that's somebody who's going to be um, crashing quite quickly. Um, and then elderly people, um, of course, are a bit more fragile um, and can, um, have, have very little reserve to tolerate blood loss. So even with a, much less blood loss, even with class one hemorrhagic shock, they might actually be a little bit more hemodynamically unstable. Um, it's also ideal if you can, um, of course, to understand what people's home medications are because that can impact how their body reacts. So for example, if somebody's on a beta blocker, they might not mount a heart rate, um, an elevated heart rate um, in response to, to, to blood loss. So that's, um, you know, again, one of the reasons why we always want to find out if we can, what people's um, home medications are, because it can impact our ability to assess um, and manage the patient accurately. 
Um, I think that I'm going to stop there um, because it's already 10 o'clock or 10 o'clock my time. <laughs> um, and I don't want to go um, too further into details um, or, or I keep boring you without um, giving you all the opportunity to ask me questions and, and get involved in um, some discussion. I've, I've laid a lot of information out to you already. I'm sure there's um, I'm sure that there's some some questions that I might have drummed up in all of that. Thank you, Dr. Beth, for the excellent presentation. Uh, I can see from the chat box uh, they're liking the presentation. They found it very relevant. Uh, until now, there is no question. Uh, please do share uh, our participants. If you have any question, you can share it on our uh, on the chat box or on the Q and A. Oh uh, yeah. There's yes, one question you. actually. Yeah. 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 On the Q and A, uh, one question says, "What is the management di uh, different between the advantage from traumatic injury?" of March, massive hemorrhage, respiratory circulation, head injury, and ABCDE, airway, breathing, circulation, disability, and exposure? Yeah, so that's a great question. And actually, this goes back to what I was saying, I think, um, you know, at the beginning of my, my discussion, which is there are many different um, systematic approaches to trauma evaluation. Um, ATLS, the ABCDE um, paradigm is what we use um, in the United States because um, it's it's just um, what uh, American College of Surgeons has promoted um, across um, nationally and, and actually internationally. Um, what's most important uh, is that the team that you're working with has a shared static approach, whether that's ABCDE or whether that's March, um, but making sure that it's um, a, a shared and understood um, approach so that you can address all of the all of the life threatening injuries um, quickly and effectively. Um, I think that the just I'm not familiar with the details of March, but just reading what you have um, uh, as it stands as it what it stands for, um, it sounds like it puts hemorrhage um, ahead of airway and um, breathing. Um, and that's interesting because um, that is a discussion that's happening in among trauma groups now in the United States is should we should we rearrange the letters in the um, in the primary survey for ATLS? Um, I think that um, in, in our experience and especially in major trauma centers, um, the the um, the way that we we approach people systematically, it this evaluation all happens quickly that it um when people under the componentously anyway um but uh so the exact order is perhaps maybe um that's why it's okay that they're they're a little bit different um yours the march has hemorrhage first and and atls has airway first um but uh but most important that it's just systematic so that you can capture those things I see this next question. At my institution, what is the cutoff point of resuscitation in blunt abdominal trauma to go for exploration? Um, that's an interesting question. So um, I would say there's not, um, it's not uh, necessarily a specific cutoff point of, of how much resuscitation, but more um, what you think are the likely injuries that a person has and, and what is the best way to manage them. So let me um, explain a little further what I mean by that. Um, we, um, in doing the primary survey, the ABCD, and as I mentioned, um, the, the cavitary triage that occurs with that, we are trying to understand what injuries are present. If somebody has a significant pelvic injury, um, you know, an open book pelvic fracture, for example, uh, the, the most important thing to do is to try to reduce that space by putting on a pelvic binder, and then the orthopedic um, team may you know, put a, uh, use an X fix of some kind. That's of course very different than doing an exploratory laparotomy for intra-abdominal bleeding. So understanding exactly what the problem is that you're trying to address will help define um, or dictate where where you go. In our system, um, the the ORs are different for orthopedic versus trauma or general surgery, and so that's why that's an important detail. Um, and then also, especially when somebody has pelvic injury. Um, 
we often will actually have those patients go to interventional radiology first, if we don't think that there's anything else that's injured. Um, so if we, if we uh, assess that there's no other injuries and only a pelvic injury, and they're not responding adequately to blood, that's somebody who we would usually actually send to interventional radiology rather than the OR. But if on our, through our primary survey and with our FAST exam, we identify blood in the abdomen, or um, or some other um, so, uh, blood in the chest, for example, some some other cavity that needs to be addressed. Um, that patient might go to the we might um, choose to go to the OR with them instead. Um, so there's not a, a specific cutoff of of quantity of fluid, but rather um, a, an understanding of what what we think what we think is the injury mechanism, and then um, and then how we can best address it. I think there is one more question. I think regarding prioritizing the airway, if the person has femoral artery bleeding, I think it's from Dr. Kassan Masafa. Oh, I see it's coming up in a different order. Um, no. Yeah, so which management priority done for an injured airway obstruction and femoral artery bleeding? So in, in our system, what I would say is, uh, uh, if you, we, we just go through everything in order, airway, breathing, circulation. So, um, that's, that, that's somebody, the patient that you're describing is somebody who would be getting intubated and have somebody putting pressure on their femoral artery, um, you know, at the same time, basically, um, the value of having the team leader is, uh, or having this organization is that you can, the team leader can say airway person, I need you to get an airway while you're doing that. Um, primary surveyor, tell me if their lungs are clear and tell me what their pulses are. And if you're seeing pulsatile bleeding, put your finger on it. <laughs> um, and so you have somebody putting pressure on the thing that's bleeding while somebody else is getting the airway simultaneously. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. It's uh, the the bleeding and airway are, are both um, uh, top, bleeding management and airway or uh, patency are both top priority um, problems. It really just depends on how many people you have around and what your resources are. So if you only have one person present, um, then um, I would imagine, you know, putting, if, if I were alone with somebody who has pulsatile bleeding from their femoral artery, I'm going to put pressure on their femoral artery first um, and, uh, and call for help. Um, that said, if they have an airway obstruction, um, holding holding the the um, the bleeding uh, area is not going to actually um, help them that much. They are they are going to expire from not being able to breathe. So that that's why the, these are challenging moments where um, it would also depend. The reason my my knee jerk would be to go hold pressure on the femoral artery and call for help for the airway is because um, I. It, 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 in that moment, if, if, uh, if I'm truly in a space where I'm alone, um, i presumably don't have the equipment to get an airway. Um, so I would, I would function with what I, what resources I have. Um, but if I have the ability to get an airway and I have another person around, then I would get the airway first what, and tell the other person to put pressure on the femoral artery. Does that make sense? Yes, Dr. Yes, Dr. Hodgman, I perfectly did. One other question uh, in the chat box. Uh, they said, uh, which, uh, what is our priority action while patients uh, face a skull fracture? Uh, oh, interesting. So um, interestingly, facial fractures are, while very distressing um, to see, um, tend to be on the priority of, um, on, the, on the spectrum of, of injuries that people have tend to be less um, immediately life-threatening than, than other things. So intracranial injury, for sure, major problem, but facial injury looks terrible, not necessarily a life-threatening problem. Um, and so that's also where um, just simply making sure that their airway is patent, that they're able to breathe, um, that, that, and that, and going through the rest of their, um, their primary survey, assessing their disability, um, is going to be an important detail for, for understanding whether they actually have an intracranial problem that requires immersion. Facial stuff, um, is, uh, often actually can be delayed, um, you know, repair of facial injuries can be delayed, um, uh, facial bony injuries rather can, can often be delayed. That said, um, 
scalp, the scalp is incredibly well perfused and the face incredibly well perfused. So one can lose a tremendous amount of blood from facial and scalp lacerations. Um, from a, from a scalation standpoint, I would say, um, if somebody has uh, lacerations that are, that are, um, bleeding quite significantly, um, that's something that you, that is a major opportunity for you to con control their bleeding and address their C, so to speak. Um, and what we often do in an emergency, um, environment with, with scalp, um, lacerations is we just take skin staplers to close scalp lacerations quickly. Um, and then facial lacerations, um, we, you can, um, de depending on what sutures you have available um, and how unstable the person is, you can um, do a you know, more formal closure or um, a very uh, a quick closure and anticipate doing a more formal repair later. Thank you very much, Dr. Hodgman. I think those are the questions uh, we had on the Q&A box. Um, so I'll leave the floor to Dr. Fuzun to tell us about it in our, in our CU, uh, CPD programs. Uh, no, I'm just going to give a quick update for attendees who have uh, joined late. Uh, if you haven't uh, reviewed her bio, Dr. Hoshman have actually have work experience in Ethiopia and particularly in Hawassa. So if you have questions uh, related to that or how we manage uh, road traffic accident and polytrauma in our setting. You can also raise questions to that. She doesn't only have experience here, she has the experience in Ethiopia. The reason I joined to add is uh, we have shared the link so that you can film an attendance form and it has four questions uh, related to the presentation Dr. Hoshman gave us today. So anyone who answers two questions or more will be able to get credit from Ethiopian Medical Association for your attendance and the CMB credit, which you can use for your license renewal at the end of the year. So please, everyone, make sure that you have filled that form. Let me just show you quickly some of the things. So this we're not at the end of the webinar. I will give Dr. Hoshman the chance to look at the chat boxes because there's a lot of people sending thank you messages at the chat box. And also there are some questions we might have missed. So if you find anything, you can answer it after me. Uh, for attendees, if uh, to get your CMEs, you know you need to make sure that you fill out the form correctly, your name and your title. And like I said, anyone who get fifty percent or more, which is just two questions and above, this is just to make sure that there was active participation. Um, also, I just want to give you some updates. So uh, this should have been at the beginning, but if you want to uh, catch up to the CME session, if you have missed the beginning, you can uh get back to it and later and watch the whole session on the Adenal YouTube channel and uh this year we have 40 plus CME sessions planned throughout the year which we coordinate with Ethiopia Medical Association Ethiopian Society of Cardiology Professionals and EDVS which is the Dermatology Society uh make sure uh, you follow our page I think Saga has been sharing the link for Adenal for professionals link which you will get updates about upcoming CME sessions so make sure you follow us and any uh, healthcare professional who wants to join our team, we have volunteers all over the world, uh, mostly based in Ethiopia and the US, and we have uh, some volunteers as well in the UK and Finland and in Rwanda. So we like to add more volunteers to, to our team. We like to add more mentors to our team. So you're always welcome. Senga has shared the link tree. So uh, join us there. Um, and again, once you fill out the form, uh, it will automatically give you the score, how much you got. So anyone who has got 50 and above, will, will you, you'll get a certificate emailed to you directly from Ethiopia Medical Association. So I'll stop sharing and then I'll let Dr. Hoshman back to the stage to answer some of the questions from the chat box. Yes, there is one question uh, on the ABC protocol is that uh, always necessary to scan all cavities, even though uh, our primary and secondary survey are all normal. So uh, oh, should I be giving people time to answer questions first before I answer this? <laughs> yeah, I think that's better <laughs> so that they cannot be distracted, yeah. yeah. Yes, and, and you can get your copy. Dr. <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> And nephrologists will always say water, get your water. <laughs> and here's the proof.
we'll be giving them five around five minutes. And uh, meanwhile, if anybody has got another question, so you can drop it on the Q and A box. Just a personal question to Dr. Hoshman. Were, were you involved in uh, management of or care of a patient with public trauma or road traffic accident while you were in Ethiopia? And what was your experience like in terms of resources and the group that um, the group work that you presented at the beginning of how everyone has you know their own defined roles? Is that how we do it back home? Uh, I, I'm not a critical care person or a surgeon, so I don't have experience with that. So um, in um, in Owasa, that my experience, um, which now is a few years, when I was there was a few years ago, when I was there last, rather, was a few years ago. Um, and the, um, the staffing in the ER um, was not necessarily, I think, I think people were not um, using defined roles clearly. Um, and also what was challenging is the way the space um, was used. Uh, patients kind of there, obviously patients come in through a triage area and then we're moving over to the front area of an ER, but it was not an area where um, the resources that one would need for um, a trauma quickly were located. So one of the things that my colleagues and I had been um, uh, trying to think about was, you know, how could we help how could we help reorganize the way the space is used to better optimize um, the ability of the care team to, to evaluate the patient? Um, and then um, the next thing that we also were talking about and, and working on was um, trying to promote um, uh, and educate everybody about the, the concept of having clear, a shared understanding and shared, um, shared roles with a systematic approach. And so to that effect, actually, um, ATLS um, courses started, um, my colleagues started running virtual ATLS courses during COVID. And right now, as we speak this week um, and last week, live in-person ATLS courses are happening in Owasa um, with some of my colleagues from the United States. Um, and some, our, some of our colleagues in Owasa have become ATLS faculty so that we can um, promulgate this, um, the concept um, uh, more, more widely. Um, I, of, of course, though, I'm, uh, as I, as we said before, there are other, other systems. So other, other um, approaches like the March paradigm that somebody else mentioned. Um, but the, the key detail is making sure that everybody on the team knows that approach um, and that whoever's running the, the, the trauma um, is, is appropriately assigning people. So it, it requires some um, some forethought about how the um, how the team in the ER is organized and and um, how the how people understand what their spaces are and what their what their abilities are. And regarding the project that you are involved in with the American College of uh, Surgery. But, yeah. Um, what, what, are, what are we trying to do in Hawassa? Like what are particular project area that you're working on? Yeah, well, so the American College of Surgeons um, in uh, in general, we are in the not even American College of Surgeons, not exclusively American College of Surgeons, but but uh, people interested in so-called global surgery, we're, we're looking to build surgical capacity um, in general. Our, our overarching goal is to um, to ensure equity um, and access to, to necessary care. And the, um, from a surgical standpoint, um, we feel quite strongly that surgery is um, uh, an important um, part of the healthcare system that people should have access to. And um, because it is complex, um, it uh, when when a system builds the, the surgical resources or the surgical capacity, you are effectively building the entire medical system's um, ability to deliver care in, in all realms. Um, so my, my colleagues and I who are in the, the global surgery realm are just um, generally trying to build surgical capacity everywhere. And, um, and our ability to take care of patients in any environment also has a lot to do with um, being able to empathize with and understand and communicate with our patients. Um, and so um, that uh, our ability to do, to do that also um, relies on our um, understanding as clinicians how to interact with people and how to understand being in a different environment or having different values or understanding of, of 
life um, from our patients. And so um, the American College of Surgeons project in particular mirrors what a lot of universities um, individually have been trying to do in establishing partnerships with um, differently resourced uh, partners in, in other parts of the world so that we can learn from each other um, in a bi-directional way so that we, we actually build each other up. We help um, build um, capacity where like um, where input might be helpful for infrastructure or for education. Um, education is one of our big um, um, avenues um, within the global surgery and within American College of Surgeons. Um, and that, and also promoting um, conversation between people so that we, between um, uh, the partners, um, so that we all understand um, uh, the challenges that everybody faces and how we can, um, how we can understand our patients better and how we can understand their challenges better. Um, from a surgical standpoint, there's also many pathologies that um, that we see um, in some environments and not at all in the other. And so we can learn from each other how to how to handle those pathologies that are rare in one place and common in, in, in the other. Um, we also, with the American College of Surgeons, we're um, with OASA are trying to help um, uh, augment the um, the research um, capacity that that um, our our colleague institutions have. So in Owasa, uh, American College of Surgeons has also um, used our Owasa partnership as the um, example of how to how to build this elsewhere. So um, if I recall correctly, I believe Tanzan there's also a partnership between American College of Surgeons and Tan uh, a hospital in Tanzania, um, and I believe there's another one um, uh, elsewhere, um, but I, I don't remember actually where that one that one is now um, occurring. But the the idea um, remains the same, or the principles are the same, like trying building conversations between people and partnerships so that everybody can um, elevate the care that we are improve access to care um, and elevate the care that we are that we are providing. Thank you so much for everything you're doing, like with the American College of Surgeons and uh, for our presentation today. I think people still have asking for a few minutes more to uh, answer the questions. So we'll, we'll give them back. But at the end, we'll be able to discuss the questions live with you, right? So everyone who filled out the form after you maybe we'll give you another five minutes three to five minutes and then when we close it and then we will uh, discuss the question live here and then we'll let Dr. Koshmat have her Saturday back. Did you see the last question that is about how they can take part in the project that you're doing? Yeah, I, I was just reading that. Um, that's that's amazing. I think um, there are a couple different um, approaches I think that um, undergraduates can take. There's an organization called um, GSSA, Global Surgery, Global Surgery Student Alliance, GSSA. Um, and, and that actually is an... Uh, um, Another one called Incision. I think they are partners. Um, GSSA and Incision are, are related. Um, those are both um, huge international at this point organizations that um, I think uh, are great opportunities for undergraduates to get kind of plugged into the system um, or plugged into that kind of um, those conversations to understand what opportunities exist. Um, from the American College of Surgeons standpoint, I think that um, the, the easiest way probably to get involved or the opportunities that exist um, would be through the faculty and through the institutions that are partners with, um, with the American College of Surgeons. Um, so I think um, a good starting point there would be if you just go to the American College of Surgeons website and let me see, I can plug it into, let me open it up. I'll, I'll put it in the chat. And I also see this other question yeah. about ACLS and ATLS, and I'll address that in just a moment while I while I pull up um, the American College of Surgeons website. I, I shared them the link for the Global Surgery Students Alliance in the chat box. Oh, perfect, excellent. And yeah, and then if you look up incision, um, that's another one. Incision.
International Student Network. I just put that in the chat and then American College of Surgeons. Okay, so here's the link for the American College of Surgeons. Just plop that into the chat as well. So then um, the somebody asked, what's the difference between a CLS, a TLS, and other um, other courses? So um, a CLS is advanced cardiac life support. So that's when somebody has a witnessed cardiac arrest. Um, that's generally on the presumption that the person is arrested, not because of a trauma, but because of um, an intrinsic cardiac problem. Um, and so a CLS um, is focused on um, how to resuscitate somebody whose heart has stopped from an arrhythmia. Um, for that reason, those, those patients almost certainly, um, have a patent airway, um, and no issues with their lungs. Um, and, and it's presumed a cart, a, a cardiac anomaly, a circulatory anomaly, an anomaly. So the ACLS paradigm, um, is circulation first, C, A, B, um, because the concern is that circulation is the thing you can presume that circulation is the thing that is compromised um, immediately and that the other stuff is not. The caveat there, of course, is that there are some circumstances where people arrest because it's a, a, a so-called respiratory arrest, meaning they, they actually were not breathing and that's why they arrested. Um, but um, a CLS is meant to um, address the, the, the vast majority, which are, um, cardiac in, in origin. Nevertheless, part of a CLS is of course also to establish an airway. So you're assuming that the cardiac, um, uh, problem is what's driving the person's arrest, but you're also getting an airway for a TLS advanced trauma life support. Um, a TLS is a course um, that is, uh, was developed by and is taught by the American College of Surgeons. Um, whereas a CLS, the cardiac life support is, uh, American Heart Association. Um, a TLS, the trauma course is focused on the presumption that the reason somebody is unwell for whatever reason, you know, whether they arrested or not, the reason somebody is unwell is because there's a traumatic injury to something. And so, um, uh, that can manifest in, in many different ways, of course. Um, obviously, hemorrhage is something that's very high on our list um, or concerns when anybody has trauma. And I always say to my trainees that um, your differential for hemodynamic instability in a trauma patient, the first, second, third, fourth, and fifth thing on your differential should be hemorrhage. <laughs> um, but um, we, um, we also acknowledge that in a trauma environment, the other things are equally um, uh, possibly injured. So air, airway patency, um, is, um, and, and breathing the, the, the lung fields, the ability to actually expand the lungs are, um, equally, um, potentially compromised, um, from, uh, from injury as, as is, um, hemorrhage leading to, to injury or leading to compromise. So I guess I the short answer that the short answer to that question is if the person has a trauma, go by ATLS. So if the person just dropped in front of you, that's a CLS cardiac. Thank you very much, Dr. Hodgman. We have nearly 90 uh, responses on the answers uh, to the quiz. I think we can share them the answer now. Cool. So let me, um, oops, I think I closed my slides. Let me just reopen them because I don't remember the order that I did it. So let me do this. Uh, okay. So the first question, um, what is the correct order? Oops, let me just move these screens out of the way of the components in the primary survey. And again, this is the primary survey per ATLS. Um, 
So the correct answer here is B, um, airway, breathing, circulation, disability, exposure. Um, conveniently, uh, that is the order of the letters in the alphabet. So hopefully that's easy to remember. <laughs> um, and that, that's the, that is the, the correct answer, B. Next question, what does ATLS, or sorry, why does ATLS recommend that order? Um, so uh, ho hopefully I've said it um, enough times that um, it's, it's obvious that C here is the correct answer. The, the reason ATLS recommends the order that we do of A, B, C, D, E is that it's the order in which injury or compromise is most rapidly life-threatening. Um, if you have no airway, no ability to deliver oxygen, um, then it doesn't matter if your blood is circulating, um, if you're circulating deoxygenated blood. Um, so if you have no air, no patent airway to deliver oxygen to your lungs and your lungs can therefore not deliver oxygen to your blood, um, that's, that's going to be immediately life-threatening. So the ATLS paradigm focuses on the order of injury that, that, um, we believe are going to be the most immediately life-threatening in that order. The other answers it's alphabetical. It's easy to remember. Um, those are, you know, sort of true. <laughs> it is alphabetical and it is easy to remember for that reason, but that's not the reason that order is specifically um, uh, promoted. And then it rhymes. That's not actually true. It doesn't rhyme. <laughs> All right. Which of the following is a landmark for chest tube placement? Um, so the answer here is C, the fifth intercostal space anterior axillary line. Um, I mentioned earlier, and I think I showed the picture just with the chest tube, uh, where to put the chest tube in, but I didn't show a picture of um, a, a thorax and, and where this landmark is um, on a person. Um, but the fourth or fifth intercostal space uh, anterior axillary line is the preferred um, location for a chest tube for trauma. Um, and that, that space, it's um, the fourth or fifth intercostal space correlates generally with the nipple line in a male um, or the inframammary, inframammary line in a female. Um, I say, I, I specifically said that in trauma, we prefer this landmark because um, some may have um, wondered about the second um, intercostal space midclavicular line, that is a landmark for um, doing needle decompression when somebody has a tension pneumothorax. The, um, and in some, um, in some um, circumstances, if somebody has a, um, a pneumothorax, some, sometimes we do um, uh, place chest tubes in the second intercostal space in the midclavicular line. But from a trauma standpoint, generally, um, when somebody needs chest tube, we are assuming um, the, um, that they're going to have some element of um, bleeding in addition to air. And so putting a tube a little at the fourth or fifth, fifth intercostal space allows you to place the tube in a both posterior and apical position. So it'll capture air and any fluid that's, that's um, uh, forming um, in the, in the patient's chest. The, um, the other spaces are less, less able to achieve that. Also, this um, is a uh, a particular problem in the United States, um, obesity uh, means that the um, it turns out that a lot of times it's it's uh, uh, easier to get into the chest cavity even with needle decompression in the fourth or fifth ax in, uh, intercostal space in the anterior axillary line rather than in the midclavicular line. So that was a very long-winded answer um, or explanation for why C here, fifth intercostal space anterior axillary line is the correct answer. And then the last question, which of the following scenarios should prompt tourniquet placement? Um, so the answer here is A, extremity bleeding that's not controlled with direct pressure. So anytime there is bleeding, the first thing one should do is put direct pressure, put a finger on it. Um, and uh, the, the challenge with bleeding that's not well controlled with direct pressure is depending on where it is, um, you can put a tourniquet on. Um, if it's an extremity, that's where the tourniquet is most readily used. It's not feasible to put a tourniquet on um, the thoracic cavity or the abdominal cavity. Um, and then the pelvic cavity also, you, you can't put a tourniquet on. Um, but if, if someone's bleeding from a, a open book pelvic fracture, um, something that I didn't get to in my talk is um, 
we do try to minimize or restore that the pelvic cavity by putting on a pelvic binder um, until the orthopedic surgery team can um, properly um, place an X fix. Um, so nevertheless, the, the question here is regarding tourniquets. Um, tourniquets really can only be placed on extremities. So the answer here is A. Um, whenever there's bleeding not controlled with direct pressure on an extremity, a tourniquet is an appropriate next step. So those are all the questions. Um, those are all my questions, rather. <laughs> Thank you so much. I think um, we have answered the question that we given you, and then I think all the questions that they put in the Q and A and the chat box have been answered. Uh, it was a wonderful session. I got a refresher about trauma. <laughs> Hopefully, I don't have to deal with it. Yeah, <laughs> I'll be there in time for the dialysis. I'll make sure. That's right. <laughs> That's right. I'll be calling you. Don't worry. <laughs> uh, Sega, you, you can finalize for us, I believe. Thank you, Dr. Hoshman, for this amazing uh, presentation. As you can see, the claps are on the air. <laughs> on the chat box, they said the, ex the presentation was really excellent. And uh, we would like to say thank you on behalf of Fit and we, uh, we we hope to see you in other uh, projects in Ethiopia as well. And uh, attendees will likely uh, will reach out to you to do much more uh, projects together. Uh, thank you for this excellent presentation of course my pleasure. Yeah. my pleasure thank you so much for having me and uh and i look forward to future projects and and more work in ethiopia thank you so much dr hoshman it's, it was a pleasure so please feel free to reach out to us to get in our work yeah, um, you have our email my contact so any lecture you your colleagues wants to give on any subjects on um for ethiopian healthcare professionals our our platform is open for you and I hope you have a beautiful weekend and Saturday. Thank you, you too. Thank you. Thank you. We will be sharing this uh, recorded file on YouTube. Uh, so anybody can find it there as well. Thank you, our attendees, for participating. Have a good day.